The Great Smoky Mountains have been inhabited by humans for thousands of years. Since the earliest natives settled here 13,000 years ago, a mixture of diverse influences have combined the rich culinary and cultural heritage. Join me as we discover what motivated those early settlers to come to the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains. Give it up. And as I meet a few present day settlers who carry on Appalachian traditions that have been passed down through generations. That's fantastic. From the Great Smoky Mountains, all for a taste of history. Straddling the borders of Tennessee and North Carolina, the Great Smoky Mountains are a stunning collection of hazy peaks, beautiful waterfalls, and a wide array of plant and animal species. In fact, this sub-branch of the Appalachian Mountains contains more species of trees than the entire continent of Europe. European pioneers settled these lands in the late 1700s and the mountain culture they established has continued to the modern day, with traditions and recipes being passed down for generations. I'm stopping in at the Great Smoky Mountain Heritage Center to check out one of those early recipes and explore their spectacular collection of historic structures and exhibits that give a glance into frontier life. Nothing makes me feel better than being here in this cabin. I love the open heart, I love the fire, I love the heat. And I'm here with Shanna, who's going to show me a simple but very spectacular dessert. Yes, and we're so glad to have you here at the Great Smoky Mountains Heritage Center. So right now we're in the Cardwell family home. It was built in 1891, and many members of this family are still alive today and often come back to their family home. The fire has a certain aroma and flavor into it, but it just feels really comfortable. It feels, it feels homey. How yes. is that? <laughs> yes, it does. Today we're gonna to be making a boiled drop cobbler. Definitely something that people coveted having during the summer season when it was berry time. So this is gonna be done with berries that you would find around in the area and something that would just tantalize their taste buds for the sweetness. It really should be called a dumpling because right. most people think of a couple of something that's baked uh, in the oven. You get a big size dumpling yeah, yeah, in yeah. this drop cobbler. <laughs> Fantastic, I mean, I, I saw your recipe, it's uh, relatively simple. And I think if you, as long as you had some, some firewood and a few ingredients, you could knock it out. And obviously, yes. most importantly, the berries, which yes. you have beautiful have blueberry have <laughs> and blackberry right in front of us. Here we have our yeah. berry picking basket. This is poplar wood. Gosh, it's interesting. And this would have been made the day of. So you would send the kids out, go find some berries. And don't come home without it. And don't come home <laughs> without it, that's right. So as they were going around, they would come across a poplar tree and they would skin it. They would use the outside bark and that's then it. the inside bark inside. When I grew up in the Black Forest, I had to do the same thing, but I didn't have a fancy basket like that. <laughs> and on top of it, most berries I ate. Yes, yes. So hard to believe. <laughs> it's obviously just picked this morning. Yep. All right, so our first step is we're gonna take the berries and the sorghum and the water and we're gonna put it in our pot here. Nice. What goes first, the berry or the, the water? The berries. Bring some water. Pour about two cups in there. Now this is a forgotten sweetener. Yes. Traditionally, they weren't gonna use as much sugar as we do now. We use a whole lot of sugar in a lot of our recipes. If they actually use sugar from the cone, they would not be using a whole lot at one time. So for that more of that sweeter well, flavor, we're you, gonna use the sorghum. You know why, right? Yes, money, very that's right. Ex very expensive, when in fancy homes, the sugar was even locked up in the yes. sugar snipper. So that makes sense. And but besides, I happen to think that this is much better to use sorghum syrup anyway, I feel. I love the flavor of yeah, sorghum. Yeah, yeah. 
so excited cooking in Dutch pots. It's just such a difference. And the flavor of the wood, because I know it penetrates also back into the food. Yes. And it's such a difference. You can never, ever, ever imitate that cooking. No, the with flavor modern is equipment. unique. Yep. It just gives you a whole different light to a dish. Open fire is my life. <laughs> so from here, we're going to start making our dumplings. Gotcha. We've got all purpose flour, yep. two cups of that. Gotcha. And we're going to take our baking powder. All baking right. powder, a little bit of cinnamon. A little bit of cinnamon. Some of our salt. And then a little bit of sugar. We'll mix all that up. And as we do this, I want to create a nice little well. Don't want the dumplings to get super clumpy. We want gooey dumplings to start off with. I got you. So now we'll work on our wet ingredients. Mm -hmm. A little bit of vanilla, some a butter. butter, some milk. You use milk, you don't use heavy cream, right? Just okay. milk. Whole milk. <laughs> and then an egg. Fresh from the chicken house. That's right. Then I'll mix this up a little. All right. So we've got our well that we've made mm -hmm. right here. We're going to start pouring our wet ingredients into it and just stir as we go. And you want to make the consistency later so that you can spoon it into the berry liquid. Yes, so we don't want it to be dry and clumpy. Yeah. It still needs to be moist. Have you ever tried to do it with maybe some sherry or some cognac into the berry? Have you? I have not, oh, but you should I've try it. thought about it a I, lot. Because I cook a lot with uh, a sherry wine you know, or Madeira. Yeah. It would be spectacular. I can just imagine it. How much do the berries have to be reduced? I don't cook them down too much. I like to have a half a whole berry. <laughs> you still want to be able to bite into it and have the juice pop in your mouth. So a couple of more minutes, but I see you have the cook stand, yeah. which is going to be easier later for you to spoon in Absolutely. the stuff. Absolutely. Because if you have it hanging, it's going to That's right, around. it's going to wobble for us. So might as well move the cook stand yeah. in and put some Let's coal in it. there. There we go, and you see why. Get some of our coals. You got it, perfect. So now, with this coal underneath, it's gonna really speed it up. Oh yes. Jana, I hear the beer is popping in there because there's so much heat, it's concentrating right underneath the pot, yes. so, so closeness, so. This nice little berry explosions going yep. on that we love. Oh yeah, oh. oh. Yeah. That's just how you want it, doesn't it? It is. It, look at it. Yeah, oh yeah, I can just see it. Oh. Hmm. Hot, oh. Wow, isn't it so simple and so beautiful? It is. What's oh, good with the fresh berries? All right, so we got got nice, healthy spoonfuls. Right you want to be real generous, right? Yes, we want to be very generous. It's all about the presentation too. The big dumplings make all the difference. One thing we always want to make sure is we're dropping them side by side, not on top of each other, to make sure that we're not going to get any raw dough in there. Right there. And now we wait. Fantastic. The aroma, you can smell everything. We're ready to go. Let's give that a oh, try. Oh, golly. 
So normally we would be turning them over one more time. It just allows the dumpling to really soak in and get all the flavors of our juice that we have right here. You know what is happening? They're screaming. Where is the ice cream? Yes. Fantastic. All right. Do you mind if I get to try it? No, I think you should have the first bite. Shanna, the moment of truth. <laughs> Give it up. Good. Mm. Look here. It's so simple, yet so elegant. It's just, just imagine. You put it on any kind of a plate, china, whatever. It's gorgeous. Yes. And the flavor is just it's fantastic. Easy, simple, flavorful. You're the best. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. Thank you so much. Beautiful. The Great Smoky Mountains are the ancestral homeland of the Cherokee Indian. For thousands of years, they hunted, foraged, and farmed these lands, and were considered one of the most culturally advanced tribes of the time. Following England's victory in the French and Indian War, Britain issued the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which prohibited settlement on Cherokee land west of the Appalachian Mountains. Despite this proclamation, migration across the mountains continued in the late 1760s, and the first settlers, sometimes known as Over Mountain Men, began establishing permanent homesteads. The Over Mountain Men, they came here looking for freedom, for opportunity, but ultimately these folks violated the British agreement with the Cherokee and were living in Upper East Tennessee, west of the Appalachians, and so it created a lot of tension. When the Revolutionary War broke out, these defiant settlers became less British colonists and more American ones, and many rebelled against the British and their Cherokee allies. This band of frontier militias would ultimately play a pivotal role in the eventual American victory. In 1780, a group of East Tennesseans dealt a surprising and decisive blow to the British at the Battle of Kings Mountain. The looming threat of the Patriot militia in the region caused British commander Charles Cornwallis to cancel his plans to invade the region any further. As he gets defeated, he realizes that there's still way too many people fighting this thing. And by this time, the French have already signed on as our allies. And so he just begins moving back to his base of operations up, up at Yorktown. It, it was a strategic battle that was won here that assisted. They were coming and we stopped them. When America gained its independence, the settlers in what is now Eastern Tennessee established their own territory in 1784 and named it Franklin, with the intention of becoming the 14th state of the new country. They set up a court system, a government. It was actually originally Frankland in order to hopefully draw the support of Ben Franklin. They changed it to Franklin <laughs> and uh, it didn't work. It failed by one vote, but it existed for four and a half years. And there was actually a very famous figure in American history that was a Franklinite that was born in the state of Franklin, that's Davy Crockett. While it never did achieve statehood, the territory of Franklin eventually became part of Tennessee when it was admitted to the Union in 1796. For the natives of the Great Smoky Mountains, a different fate was in store. Following the Indian Removal Act of 1830, the Cherokee were forcibly removed from their ancestral homelands and harshly relocated to federal lands west of the Mississippi River. 4,000 Cherokee died of hunger, disease, or exhaustion along this 1,200-mile walk in what would come to be known infamously as the Trail of Tears. The descendants of those who escaped removal reorganized in the 20th century and established the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. With a growing population of over 15,000, they continue to persevere and preserve their culture on their ancestral lands in the valleys of the Great Smoky Mountains. Hi, Chef, my name is Lily, and I'm from the Museum of the Cherokee, and we would like to welcome you here. What a beautiful, beautiful museum. It's just a very spectacular. Well, thank you so much. It's definitely a rich culture and it's something I'm very proud of. So these are pucker toe moccasins. 
These are significant to Eastern tribes, but the specific style is significant to Cherokees. That's amazing. So you could actually identify a tribe by its moccasin? Mm -hmm. Western tribes mostly do flat top plain moccasins, and you'll see intricate beadwork. And so our beadwork is mostly on the sides. Uh -huh. The way moccasins are made is they're originally one solid piece of fabric, leather. And so the leather I'm working with today is just regular cow's leather. And you'll see that there's a difference between these two sizes. So with smaller feet, you don't want to use thicker leather such as elk because you have to put these puckers through these holes that is pressed into the leather. I do it with an owl like this. You press it through, you make a hole, and you're mm -hmm. going to take a, another strip of leather and you place it and pull it through. But if you have a thicker leather for smaller feet, it's going to be more difficult to make the pucker. So you want thinner leather for smaller feet. And eventually we pull it together one by one. Gotcha. Like this. And so this baby moccasin will look very similar to this. Very interesting. It's one of our traditions that we just don't want to die. So there's a mad dash as a historian to preserve our culture and our traditions and of course our language on top of that. Oh, I'll take it me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if you can fit a size six. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so, but it's really interesting. They feel like really nice, expensive God, socks. Yes, 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 beautiful. The idea of conservation probably never really occurred to most of the settlers that came into this area, and that really didn't start until people began seeing what happened with the logging industry that came in in the very late 19th and early 20th centuries. And so most of what's now Great Smoky Mountains National Park was clear cut. It was completely bald, which caused lots of environmental impacts. And that's when people began to realize they needed to do something differently to help preserve not only the unique landscape of the Smoky Mountains, but to help that land heal and bring it back to as close to original state as possible. But a lot was passed along generation to generation. Of course, one of those is food traditions. And the food traditions here are often hundreds of years old. Jeff David, it is a pleasure to meet a young world of shape. <laughs> and, and the reason I'm saying that is because your philosophy from farm to table is exactly what I've been doing all my life. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you for coming to the Appalachian. Thanks for coming to East Tennessee. All the dishes that we do here in the restaurant, they pay respect to Appalachian tradition. Myself, uh, I always think about my mamma. I grew up with stories of her you know, slaughtering pigs, picking vegetables out of the garden, and building the fire, quite frankly. So anytime we approach a dish, I always keep her in mind. 88 years old, Ooh. tough as nails. <laughs> yeah. I've seen a lot of things in my days. I've never, ever had pickled rams, ever, ever, ever. Yeah, so when you, when you told me about that you're pickling rams, because I know how difficult it is. Matter of fact, you told me earlier uh, you need a special permit to go get them, right? Yeah, in the state of Tennessee, on public lands, you need a special permit. And uh, your sous chef already gave me the recipe, yeah. but it won't help me any because I won't be able to get any rams. Yeah, well, you know, it's a it's an Appalachian delicacy. You know, there's only a very short time window that they're that they're fresh and in season, and we take advantage of that, and then we try to preserve as many as we can throughout the year. Oh man, oh, that's beautiful. Oh yeah. So the first thing is the beans that you use for the dish. Yeah, so today we're using some trout beans, also known as Jacob's cattle beans, mm -hmm. the heirloom variety of yep. beans. So the beans have been soaked overnight and then we've just been slowly cooking those. Oh yeah. Soup beans are one of the most quintessential dishes of Appalachia. We have winters that are much harsher than what you would see in the rest of the South. Gotcha. And this is a great winter warmer. And this is a Osball pig, cured it smoked it and aged it. One of the finest pigs you can get. When you take the hocks, obviously you braise them slowly with the beans. After we pick the meat from the ham hock, we put it back in the beans. You can see the onions in yep, there. Yep. And then just the, the natural pot liquor in uh, there yep, yep, yep. Is, uh, is kind of the prize. All right. Traditional Southern cornbread, no sugar, no flour. It keeps its moist nature from, you know, quite a bit of sour cream and kind of the base of, of cream corn. The pickled ramps. It's just like unbelievable. Plenty of these. The well, chow chow is a, is a simple relish made from pretty much the whole garden in the summer. So 
cabbage, peppers, green tomatoes. Or... Chef, this is how we serve it in the restaurant. You tell me what you think. Obviously, that first thing I got for the pick. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, man. And the cornbread is such a nice uh, accompaniment to that. In my opinion, this is in complete harmony. Everything kind of fits together very well. Yeah. It's not too spicy. You get the flavor, and obviously, uh, those little babies here, I cannot get enough. Yeah. That's a home run. Thank you very much. The hearth that we have here is the centerpiece of this restaurant. Cooking on wood and 100% wood is what defines East Tennessee cook. We cook over 100% hickory and oak, so hardwoods, great heat and great flavor. The hanger steak is probably my favorite cut. It comes right in between the rib and the plate. Yeah, right there on the side. It's otherwise known as the butcher's cut. The old school butchers, they used to take this cut home for their family. There wasn't enough to put out in their meat case, uh, so they took this home for themselves. It has an incredible beef flavor, incredible marbling. Once you cook this to a nice medium rare, well rested, slice it against the bias, it's incredible. And you just wet age it, that's it? Just wet age. 20, 28 days, I would assume? Yeah, 28 to 35 okay. is usually perfect, perfect. where we like to do it. See, tonight you got me really excited when I saw that because... Yeah, so we got very lucky. I, yeah, seriously. I went out by the woods right around where I live, and we found these chanterelle mushrooms. In Philadelphia, $24 a pound. 24 Yeah, and it's a bargain. That's pretty good. Maybe I'll bring some up to Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> and then the potato is uh, interesting. I read your recipe. Yeah, so these are French fingerling yep, potatoes. Yep. We kind of par cook them, and then we finish them here on the grill. Uh, so they pick up that smoky, charred flavor that really contributes beautifully to the dish. So the hanger steak itself, simple kosher salt. I don't use much else. I want you to to pick up the full flavor of this of cut. The meat. Mm -hmm. This is a very fine kosher salt, so so we go pretty heavily on it. We'll put this straight on the grill. We like a, a well-rested medium rare. So we're gonna throw the potatoes What's on What's unique there. about your potato that it, it picks up the flavor of the, of the hickory again. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, everything that we do has a little bit of that smoke, a little bit of that char. This dish is no different. Going in with the garlic. Right behind it with the chanterelles. The saute of the chanterelles, we start with the, the chopped garlic and the cast iron, and then the nice hard sear of the chanterelles in the pan with the garlic. Season that with a little bit of salt. For the hanger steak, we grill it roughly about three to four minutes on each side and allow it to rest. Gravy right on a plate. Can't say enough about gravy. You know, this is all about using every part of the animal. Line them right in the center. Then we take our hanger stick. Slice it against that grain. Yeah. Beautiful medium rare. The big slaughterhouses would use to chop it up for stew meat, you know that? Yeah. Or grind it up in their burger. Yep. But it is my favorite cup. And then we take our chanterelle mushrooms with the garlic right on top. Allow them to fall as they may. And last oh. but not least, a little bit of this beautiful sea salt and some chives. Absolutely spectacular. I couldn't do better or change anything on it. The dishes we did today, 
have simplicity, have flavor, have heart, have harmony, have love. That means a lot. I think your entire uh, cuisine thrives on the flavors that comes of this grill. So obviously it's, it's a little obvious to me that that was one of your main objectives, right? Absolutely. You know, the, the smoke, the char, that's what we're all about. And then otherwise, you know, it's all about sourcing the highest quality ingredients possible. Yeah. And there's a lot of work that have been put into these ingredients and uh, we just try not to mess them up from there. Now, the only favor I have to ask you, you got to give me your phone number of your grandmother so I can call her and tell her what a great <laughs> job you did and how much you talked about it. She her. would love that. And all this for an unbelievable taste of history from Tennessee.